This episode is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. DirecTV Stream brings you the live TV you love. That means you can stay up to the minute on 24-hour live news, from entertainment to current events, wherever you are in the U.S., whether that's at home, on your TV, or streaming on the go. And you get your favorite live sports, so you can catch this season's biggest games. Get the best of live TV with DirecTV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. This episode is brought to you by Google. Google's two-step verification was built to secure your account and help prevent cyber attacks, even if your password is compromised. That's why Google has made it easy to sign into your account with this additional layer of protection. Just one tap and you're in. Learn more at safety.google. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 105, Up in Smoke. During his time as Chancellor of the Exchequer, Winston enjoyed the excitement of leadership, battling the laborites, and when they raised their heads, any organized entity to the left of labor. Those radicals were welcome to stay in Russia. But there were times when he ignored that little voice in his head, when his instincts were true, but instead followed party lines. Then there were times when he went with his gut, and being a compassionate creature, made a call for the common good. However, all this led to Winston drawing a clear distinction between himself, the seemingly spontaneous politician, and Neville Chamberlain, the conservative stalwart. The sum total of this being, Churchill was more often than not alone on party issues, but just happened to have the rank to get his way. For example, going back on the gold standard was something he didn't feel was right but didn't feel confident enough to act on that instinct. The deed was done, but the move hurt the country, which continued economically to struggle. And Winston, being a compassionate conservative, spread out the government's safety net as much as his party allowed him. Still, a showdown was shaping up between the Minister of Health and himself. Sadly, again, his instincts failing him Winston was not even aware of this at first. Meanwhile, free trade, Winston's answer to almost everything economic, was losing its popularity. But Churchill did not see this either, because as he was a contented man, went on with his life, not sensing the ever-growing threat to himself. It's also fair to say that Winston's country, and the Western world in general, had lost their perspective as well. Bernard Shaw believed and wrote that as there was no world government yet, Britain was currently the most qualified to serve in that role. The kellogg bryan Pact, supported by the U.S. Secretary of State, had literally outlawed war as a way to settle international disputes. Italy, with Mussolini in charge for the last five years, had just signed a 20-year friendship treaty with Ethiopia. Its sentiments would last less than a decade. As touching Il Duce, the bombastic Italian dictator had many admirers, one of them being Winston, who now had an opportunity to visit the statesman at the beginning of the new year, 1927. Churchill could not help but be impressed with the sharpness of the people, at least those he came into contact with. Everyone's uniforms were pressed, their salutes smart, the schoolchildren didn't speak unless spoken to, and Mussolini made it clear that he was a huge fan of Winston's World Crisis series. When Winston left Mussolini's presence on the first night of their visit, he told the country's leader he needed to correct some proofs for the next volume to which the loud Italian exclaimed that if anyone got in the way of getting his next book out, he should let Mussolini know who would make sure they regretted being born, or whatever the Italian version of that is. Thus far, concerning British internal politics, Winston had not harmed himself while in Italy, but then the British cabinet member did indeed foul most grievously. 
After meeting with the leader two more times, Winston spoke to the press. And what he meant to say and what others heard were two very different things. Churchill praised the Italian leader, keep in mind this is 1927, for combating the world's real calamity, communism. He added, quote, externally, your movement has rendered a service to the whole world, unquote. As can be imagined, the liberal and labor members back home, whose leanings were closer to Lenin's than the Tories, howled over this. But Churchill was simply sticking to the British tried-and-true method of backing a continental power that was at odds with Britain's greatest enemy. At the moment, in Winston's eyes, that was Russia. Leaving the Roman capital, and hopefully the building storm, Winston, with his brother Jack and son Randolph in tow, headed south, just in time to see Vesuvius erupt. And then, though less momentous to all but the man himself, when on Malta, Churchill played his last game of polo. Simply, the body could not cash the checks his heart was writing, a point in life we all must face. But before leaving the area, Churchill, again with Randolph at his side, was received by Pope Pius XI. But as a high government official serving a Protestant king, Winston wouldn't be kissing anything. Instead, a compromise was worked out in where Churchill would bow three times when entering the room His Holiness was in. After this frigid beginning, the two men hit it off when they both discovered the antipathy the other felt for the Bolsheviks. Returning home at the end of January 1927, Winston jumped back into his hectic, but pleasingly so, public and private life. There were books to write, canvases that needed covering with paint, walls to be put up or torn down, and as always, guests to entertain. From this period comes Winston's best, in a relaxed kind of way, book about his early life. Entitled My Early Life, Winston takes a jolly look at his formative years and wonders how he made it this far. This is, of course, available on Audible. Wink, wink. His next literary adventure was suggested to him by T.E. Lawrence, who was now a member of the RAF. Quote, If the gods give you a rest, someday, won't you write a life of the great Duke of Marlborough about our only international general, and so few people seem to see it? Unquote. So, soon after my early life, Churchill's research committee was put to the task of gathering the detailed information about the Duke. When someone discovered his team and asked, well, yeah, but what about the narrative? Winston replied, oh, I have all that in my head. The work, personal this time, continued to flow. The articles, books, pamphlets never stopped coming out, and the money never stopped coming in. Unfortunately, Winston was wisely putting most of it in the New York Stock Exchange, the 1920s were coming to a close. By early 1929, Winston, however, after burning the candles at both ends for so long, started paying the price. Just after getting over a bout of influenza, those around the man saw him gear up to return to his hectic, though productive, regimen. So an informal intervention was arranged. Lord Beaverbrook offered to take Winston on his yacht to Amsterdam and back, making sure no speed records were broken. Then the Duke of Westminster enticed Winston to Scotland for some hunting and fishing. However, the king had an easier time of it. He simply ordered the Chancellor North to Balmoral for grouse hunting. While there, Winston took the time to paint the view from his highness's window. The painting then sold for 120 pounds. Desirous of being invited back one day, the artist made sure no paint was dropped on his sovereign's carpets. After that compulsory yet profitable trip, Winston crossed over to Belfast, where some years ago he and the missus managed to barely escape, heads attached. The tone this time was markedly different. The Queen's University gave him an honorary degree, the students gave him a shillelagh or walking stick or club. 
It serves both purposes rather well. A patty hat, otherwise known as a flat cap or golf cap, and ended it all with a ride around on the student's shoulders. But soon it was time to return home. Free trade had come under fire again, but this time from within Winston's own party. By 1929, the Tories had been in power for five years. The Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, needed to call for an election. However, an organization called the United Empire League, it believed in tariffs, had been winning in impressive by-elections against Tory candidates. Their victories, covered in the press, seemed to be the writing on the wall for the Conservatives. To make this even more unpleasant for Winston, Lord Beaverbrook, who made the Amsterdam trip possible, was supporting the League. As Prime Minister Baldwin was better than most at reading the political tea leaves, he decided to give the voting public what they wanted, or seemed to want. The Prime Minister announced he was open to the idea of tariffs and was ready to discuss a compromise. Baldwin, like Beaverbrook, started sidestepping away from the now-angered Chancellor of the Exchequer. Party members soon followed in the Prime Minister's steps. Winston, though, was, as usual, in too much of a flurry to truly notice this. As the general election came closer by mid-1929, Winston's natural state of optimism evaporated as talk started making its way around about who would succeed Baldwin as the Tory head when the party in the future struggled for supremacy once again. This supposed, of course, that the Tories would soon be out of power. But to Winston's thinking, all they had to do was tell the people their choice was between the Tories, i.e. stability, and socialism. But what Winston could not see between his hunting trips with royalty and sailing on his friend's yacht was that the people had had enough of struggling and socialism, or something like it, didn't look so bad at the moment. The talk of the Tories' future continued, though in hushed tones. It seemed obvious to all that the battle for the future was between Winston, who certainly craved power, but thought he had earned it by now, and Chamberlain, who may have gotten a late start to this political game, but was a fast learner. For the many who were not going to back Winston, it wasn't that they embraced Chamberlain so much. It was just that Winston, well, Lord Derby put it this way, quote, I believe in Winston's capability, if only he were a bit more steady, but you never know what kite he is going to fly next, unquote. This anxiety was generated from Winston's actions from when he did and did not listen to his instincts. Be that as it may, Neville's supporters got to work. Step one had to be to remove Winston from his powerful position at number 11. So, whispers were poured into the Prime Minister's ears that Churchill was just too unstable for such a position as the Chancellor. With his flair and energy, he was much more suited to, say, Secretary of State for India. Though why someone would accept a demotion when nothing, as far as the person could divine, was amiss, was simply glossed over. But the pressure was kept on the Prime Minister, who eventually caved in and asked Winston his impression of this idea. Churchill turned it down immediately. Hi, this is Nathaniel Lloyd, host of the podcast about historical myths and misconceptions, historical blindness. I'm here to tell you that maybe you've already earned that fun you keep putting off, thinking you don't quite deserve it yet. Maybe fun should be on your to-do list and not at the bottom of it, since we never seem to reach the end of those lists these days. Prioritize yourself and add some diversion and enjoyment to your daily routine with Best Fiends, the puzzle adventure game you can play anytime, anywhere. I'm on level 145 and I can tell you, it's so easy to pick up and play between tasks, even if you've only got a few minutes free. You can play offline, even when you're out and about with no Wi-Fi. And you'll always find new fiends to collect and new levels to beat. And seasonal challenges, too, like the ongoing Season of Seas, in which you can earn rewards by completing tasks. You've earned your fun time. 
Now go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. It didn't take Winston too many seconds to figure out the source of this offer. And so, in a gesture of political goodwill, wrote to the Prime Minister that he intended to include Neville in future Treasury decisions. This Chamberlain turned down immediately. It would not do to get along with Churchill. He, Neville, needed the man gone. But demoting his opponent was only a part of Chamberlain's plan. The other half was to ingratiate himself to Baldwin, which he did to an amazing degree. The Tories might soon lose, but Baldwin would still be a power to reckon with. And why reckon when you can a lie? Now that Winston was paying attention, he could see for himself that his light did not shine as bright for the Prime Minister anymore. Accepting this, he wrote to his wife, quote, I have made up my mind that if Neville Chamberlain is made leader of the Conservative Party, or anyone else of that kind, I clear out of politics and see if I cannot make you and the kittens a little more comfortable before I die. Only one goal still attracts me, and if that were barred, I should quit the dreary field for pastures new. Unquote. The election was held on May 30th, 1929. Winston, as a national figure, was expected to speak for other Tories, and he did his duty. But he, just like every other candidate, had to fight for his place. So Clementine stepped up again and campaigned when her husband was stumping for another. The mood of the country during the election was ugly. It was expectant. It was time for a change. To sum up the mentality of those voting that day, Sir John Boyd Orr expressed it best. Quote, a ruling class living on dividends, masses of the people on the dole, and a government trying to maintain an uneasy status quo. Unquote. Not sure if he meant that to rhyme. That night, as the results were coming in, Winston was with Baldwin at number 10. Together they pieced the results of the voting counties, which, before too long, spelled out the end of their reign. As the night went on, Churchill's face got redder. He got louder. And finally, his language fully embraced its more guttural aspects. The invectives that flew out of him were not and could not be recorded verbatim by those around him that night. By the next morning, all the votes were in, and it was all over. Labor had captured 288 seats, the Tories, 260, and coming in last, the Liberals, with 59. The only bright spot was that Winston had held on to his seat, but just, winning with 48% of the vote. Winston and others urged Baldwin to combine their seats with the Liberals, and thus maintain a majority. But after thinking it over during the weekend at Checkers, the Prime Minister decided, no, they would all embark on the Windsor train and lay their seals of office at the King's feet, or rather, desk. As was now appropriate, it was time to play the blame game. Winston told the former Prime Minister that he blamed the Tory party manager, but Baldwin, according to Beaverbrook, replied, no, there was no one more unpopular than Churchill himself. It was the beginning of the end of that mutually self-serving friendship. To prove that life enjoys a good slice of irony every now and then, as the Churchills could no longer live at number 11 Downing Street, they decided to rent the London home of Venetia Montague, the former Prime Minister Asquith's former special friend. The world of politics, intrigue, and dalliances is truly a small one and probably interconnected. Winston, being Winston, was still hopeful about his future, and the future of his party. They would be back. In fact, he saw himself as one of the major architects of that future return. But that vision of himself was dashed within one week of Labour taking power. When Ramsay MacDonald, the new Prime Minister, announced his intention to remove all British troops from Egypt 
for budgetary reasons, except those, of course, near the canal. Winston instinctively rose to argue the foolishness of it. His instincts also told him that Baldwin would be supporting this. But when Churchill turned, as is proper, to get the nod from the party leader, he saw the former prime minister sitting silent and disapproving. Added to this, within seconds, were catcalls to sit down and hissing from members of his own party. Churchill surmised, concerning this issue, it was evident that I was almost alone in the house, which was certainly true in more ways than one. With the weight of leadership taken off his hands, Winston decided to focus on the promise he made to Clementine to exert his considerable will and talent and make some more money for his pussycat and their kittens. So a tour was lined up for Canada and the United States. The idea was to land additional writing projects and meet with new publishers. Taking off on August 3, 1929, from Southampton, on the Empress of Australia, Winston was joined by his son, Randolph, now 18, his brother, Jack, and Jack's son, Johnny. During the voyage, as the others relaxed, Winston worked, made another 5,000 pounds or so, and planned on sinking this latest pile of cash into the Stock Exchange of New York. When in Canada, his first port of call, Winston was able to meet the people he wanted to meet, but also was met by people that wanted to meet him. It was a delightful time, and Winston was very touched by the thrill he brought to the average men and women just by shaking their hands. The still magnate Charles Schwab, no relation to the investing Schwab, was talked into lending Winston his private rail car, which had everything and more that Winston could possibly need. Taking advantage of the wireless radio, Winston kept up with the stock market and felt he was doing all he could for his family. The forests of Canada amazed Churchill, who said to his son, as he thought out loud, Fancy cutting down all those beautiful trees to make pulp for those bloody newspapers, and calling it civilization. Winston, who couldn't help but give speeches, and was certainly asked to, told the press that he shuddered when he heard that France was cutting back its army. He went on, the simple truth was that Germany, France's rival, had twice as many men of military age, and had twice already attacked their neighbor. Winston also couldn't help but paint, when time allowed. But this time, it was while donning a sombrero to protect him from the sun. Ready to cross into the U.S., Winston's troop loaded themselves up with as much alcohol as they could carry, fortifying their constitutions against prohibition. While in California, Winston got to meet the newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst, who, although was an Anglophobe, was also a businessman and he wanted Winston to write for his newspapers. Winston agreed to this. He, too, was there for business. But after seeing Hearst's home, San Simeon, which made Blenheim seem quaint, the writer demanded and got 40,000 pounds for 22 articles. This deal alone would have secured his family for some time. And what's a trip to California without seeing the Hollywood studios? At a dinner that night, Winston saw Charlie Chaplin, who he once hosted at Chartwell. Churchill told the actor that he wanted him to play a young Napoleon, that he, Churchill, would write the script. Alas, it was not to be. Chaplin replied that what he really wanted to do was play Jesus Christ, to which Winston replied, Have you cleared the rights? But the good times and the bright future were about to come crashing down. After crossing the country in style in Schwab's private rail car, Winston was in New York as the stock market crashed. Because his grasp of economics hadn't altered that much from when he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Winston was slow to truly realize how his and other lives would be changed. That night during a dinner at a New York mansion, when Churchill was toasted, he responded by thanking his friends, and former millionaires. But time would show that the New York stock market had just lost some $30 billion. 
dollars. As for Britain, Winston would later write that the crash had turned his country into one vast soup kitchen. But there was more to it than that. The number of British unemployed would quickly be doubled, forcing the country to go off the gold standard. And politics, Europe-wide, but especially in Germany, would become radicalized. As for Churchill himself, his financial independence was gone. All he had procured during the 1920s by his hard work had vanished in a pile of ticker tape. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Uh, before I let you go, I just wanted to ask slash inform the members that I'll be doing their two episodes near the end of the month. I want to do one more Churchill. Um, it may be the last one. I'm not sure. It depends on how much I want to cover, but we're almost there. Uh, but I'll do your the two membership episodes back to back, so we'll make your listening experience um, that much better. Um, but before I let you go, I wanted to thank a couple people. Um, see Richard E. from Los Angeles, California for your donation. Thank you. And then I think this is funny. John R. from Toronto, Ontario, um, bought a Churchill mug a couple months ago. Then he broke it. So he had to order another one. So, um, John, you just keep ordering them and maybe breaking them. And one day I'll be able to do this full time. But anyway, thank you to San Shannon C. for her part in on all that. Uh, I'd like to thank Jean Guy G, who ordered two Churchill mugs, who lives all the way in Japan. I've never sent anything to Japan before. That was pretty cool. And then there's John C. from Pennant Hills, Australia, who, was, who became a member and ordered a mug. So thank you very much. And lastly, um, I just wanted to thank those people who have recently entered into the Churchill mug contest. This certainly isn't everyone's name. I just wanted to thank these people, and they've entered in the last couple of days. Then there's uh, Andy D., who is from his iPhone, uh, Douglas A. from Brooklyn, New York, Teddy H. from Long Island, New York, Brenda B. from New South Wales, Australia, and Werner P., again from his iPhone, and then there was a Matt C. So thank you, everyone. When I do the last one, last Churchill episode, it may be this next one. It may be one more after that. That's when I'll do the um, mug giveaway. We're going to give away five Churchill mugs and then get back to the war. So again, if you want to enter that, just uh, send me an email to wwiipodcast at gmail.com. So I will see you uh, as soon as I can again with maybe the last Churchill episode.